Good morning, members. Chairman, we're ready to begin. Chairman, please open the meeting. Good morning. We're ready to call the board meeting to order. Ms. Davis, please call the roll. Good morning, Chairman Vasquez. Present. Vice Chair Schaefer. Present. Member Gaines. Present. Member Cohen. Present. Good morning. Deputy, good morning, Deputy Controller Stowers. Present. The quorum is present and the board meeting is now called to order. Oh, we'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand. That does not apply. To Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Members, just a quick reminder uh, that, you know, we're all uh, speakers and the board members, we're all simultaneously on a shared open tele uh, teleconference call line. And our your patience is definitely needed here. And please remember to call yourself out uh, and be recognized just so the transcriptionist can clearly hear and properly record the meeting. Ms. Davis, please announce our first order of business. Our first order of business is an announcement from Acting Chief of Board Proceedings, Henry Nanjo, regarding public teleconference participation. Mr. Nanjo, are you ready? Yes, thank you very much, Ms. Davis. Go ahead. Good, thank you. Good morning, and thank you for joining today's Board of Equalization meeting via teleconference. Through the, throughout the duration of today's meeting, you will pr be primarily in a listen-only mode. As you may know from our public agenda notice and our website, we have requested that individuals who wish to make a public comment fill out the public comment submission form found on our additional information webpage in advance of today's meeting, or alternatively, participate in today's meeting by providing your comments live. After the presentation of an item has concluded, we will begin by identifying any public comment requests that have been received by our board proceeding staff with the ATT operator providing directions for you to identify yourself. After all known public commenters have been called, the operator will also provide public comment instructions to the individuals participating via teleconference. Accordingly, if you intend to make a public comment today, we recommend you dialing into the meeting on the teleconference line as the audio broadcast on our website experiences a one to three minute delay. When giving a public comment, please limit your remarks to three minutes. We ask that everyone who is not intending to make a public comment, please mute their line or minimize background noise. If there are technical difficulties when we are in the public comment portion of our meeting, we will do our best to read submitted comments into the record at the appropriate times. Thank you for your patience and understanding. Back to you, Ms. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Nanjo. <clears throat> Chairman, are you ready? Are you ready for me to call the first item? Yes, please do so. Thank you, Excuse sir. Me. Oh, I, I hear somebody. Yes, it's good morning, everyone. It's Malia Cohen. Oh, um, before Ms. Davis calls the roll, Mr. Chairman, I, I wasn't quite sure where the appropriate time on the agenda, but I'd like to um, sentiments about today. I have a, a statement on the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Um, to the United States Constitution, which actually guarantees the suffrage uh, of women and solidifies the right for women to vote. So if now is not the appropriate time, please let me know, but we, I'd like to just acknowledge this momentum, momentous occasion. I'm fine with you doing it now, unless there's an objection from any of the other members. Colleagues, may I take a few minutes? It's not long, it's really just brief. Thank you. Um, Hold on a minute. Bear with me. Hold on. I think this enhances my sound. Can you guys hear me a little better? Okay. Um, 
All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate a few minutes. And ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, August 18th, 2020 is a um, an important date that I just want to acknowledge because today we are celebrating a milestone in American history. Uh, 100 years ago today, on August 18th, 1920, the 19th Amendment was uh, in the United States for the United States Constitution was ratified and it simply guaranteed the right to vote for women, which is interesting because here we are today with a few women sitting on this body, I being one of the electeds. Um, this affirmation of basic human rights is but one in a long struggle to ensure that all people, regardless of the sex, of their race, their ethnic background or national origin, um, enjoy the common rights enjoyed by all. The fight to the vote for women, um, it's not easy. The first stirring of a movement dated back to the 1820s and 30s during a period when millions of women and men were in bondage to slavery. And during this time when the bondage and submission were in ingrained in the American culture, a group of abolitionists, mainly women, white women, gathered in, 19, in 1848 in Seneca, New York. And the group's declaration of sentiments proclaimed very simply, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This, quite frankly, meant that women must have the right to vote. And then in 1869, after the end of the Civil War, a group emerged. They called themselves the National Women Suffrage Association, which was famously founded by Miss Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. And this marked a renowned, a renewed campaign for women's suffrage that extended through the progressive era into the early 1900s. Finally, in the with the ratification of the 19th Amendment, Today, in 1920, over 18, over 8 million women voted for the first time across the United States. 8 million women, first time, was in 1920. So today, here we are, 100 years later, celebrating the end. Wells, who fought for, the, for right, voting rights to be extended to black women. And on the shoulders of so many courageous women and courageous men stood with us as our allies, we stand today as a country where there is no debate about the rights of a woman to fully participate as voting citizens. However, we must also remember that for far too long, true voting rights didn't include African Americans. It was only in 1965 that the Voting Rights Act passed months after Congressman John Lewis marched across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama. So true, voting rights for all are a thing in our history. Uh, voting rights is something that we must fight for every day, especially in this momentous moment where we recognize Senator Kamala Harris. Major national parties have had only four women, four, on their presidential tickets. Geraldine Ferraro in 1984, Palin in 2008, Hillary Clinton in 2016, and now Kamala Harris in 2020. So needless to say, we've come a long way, excited and delighted, uh, but still the road ahead uh, on this journey for women's rights and rights for all is still a, a bumpy and long road. And with that, Mr. Chair, I thank you for allowing me a few minutes. I will conclude my remarks and look forward to our BOE meeting. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you for your words. Uh, uh, Chair. Uh, Vice Chair Schaefer. Sure, go ahead. Uh, today is the birthday of Rosalind Carter, President Carter's uh, wife. I just wanted to wish her a happy birthday now that we're speaking up for prominent women. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Davis, if you can please call our first item. Our first item on the agenda is C1, Taxpayers' Bill of Rights hearing, to allow taxpayers to comment on items in the uh, Taxpayer Rights Advocates Annual Report or issues related to the agency's administration of its tax programs. Taxpayers can share their experiences with property tax problems. 
Ms. Thompson will begin by making her opening remarks. After Ms. Thompson makes her remarks, there will be an opportunity for taxpayers to comment. Ms. Tax Ms. Thompson, are you ready to begin? Yes, thank you. Good morning, Chair Vasquez and honorable board members. I'm Welcome. Lisa Thompson. Hello? Welcome. No, go ahead. Thank you. I'll go ahead and start. Uh, good morning, Chair Vasquez and honorable board members. I am Lisa Thompson, Taxpayer Rights Advocate and the Chief of the Taxpayer um, Taxpayers Rights Advocate Office. We are here to conduct the annual Taxpayer Bill of Rights held in accordance with the Morgan Property Tax Bill of Rights and the California Taxpayer Bill of Rights. Before we extend the opportunity to the public to provide comments, I will go over the format uh, and the order of the proceedings um, and um, then go over the contents of the Taxpayer Rights Advocate Annual Report that serves the basis for this hearing, which is the 2018-19 uh, Taxpayers uh, Advocate Annual Report. So, um, as to the order of the speakers, those that gave advance notice uh, before the hearing to our board proceeding sections or the Taxpayer Rights Advocate Office will be invited to speak first. And then those on the teleconference will be um, invited um, to speak after that. So, um, after each speaker provides their comments, then I will briefly provide comments as to our um, past interactions and workings with that taxpayers, if that has occurred, um, and actions that we have taken to address the speaker's concerns. Um, the purpose of this hearing is to allow taxpayers, assessors, and other local agencies the opportunity to provide comments before the selected board um, as to the contents of the most recent taxpayer uh, bill of rights um, report for purposes of correcting any problems that are described in that report. Parties can also comment on any board administered programs or local property tax issues or items that are currently being worked on with um, our office. Individuals may present their concerns right regarding the agency services or issues related to the administration of our tax programs, including state and uh, local property taxes, the alcoholic beverage tax, and the tax on insurers. The hearing is held under the statute, certain statutory provisions. And uh, with respect to property taxes, the statute is Revenue and Taxation Code Section 5906D, which states, the board shall annually conduct a public hearing soliciting the input of assessors, other local agency representatives, and taxpayers to address the advocate's annual report pursuant to section 5904 and to identify a means to correct any problems identified in that report. For the alcoholic beverage tax, the statute is section 32463, which reads, the board shall conduct an annual hearing before the full board where industry representatives and individual taxpayers are allowed to present their proposals on the changes to the alcoholic beverage tax law, which may further improve voluntary compliance and the relationship between taxpayers and government. Um, the taxpayer Taxpayer Rights Advocates Annual Report that pertains to this hearing is the 2018-19 report, which was published in February of of 2020. And um, this report included discussions of problems or issues that uh, in the area of property taxes and contain examples of property uh, tax cases illustrating how the Taxpayer Rights Advocate Office helped taxpayers resolve a problem. Additionally, the report um, describes our involvement in topics, uh, important educational topics to assist taxpayers in understanding various uh, topics. We, um, before we invite taxpayers to share their experiences or voice their concerns um, or problems that they may be having, um, I would like to share with how we have uh, helped some taxpayers throughout the year and highlight an educational tool that we developed uh, for taxpayers. So for fiscal year 2018-19, our office worked on 230 cases, all in the area of property taxes. 
and 72 of those originated from um, inquiries sent through our uh, website through an in, uh, intake form and also phone calls and 58 of those were forwarded from board members offices after taxpayers contacted the board members office seeking assistance. Um, the majority of taxpayers um, were from District 1 and District 2 um, with the other two districts uh, represented as well. Um, the majority of cases pertain to evaluations such as value reduction, change in ownership, exclusions from reassessment, appeals, exemptions, and new construction. Um, many of the cases uh, for value reductions and uh, new construction involved disaster relief since California saw so many disasters during 2018-19 uh, due to the wildfires. Um, the remaining cases were in the administrative area um, category, which includes topics such as um, refunds and uh, tax bill penalties. Um, this year, the annual report identified uh, taxpayers experiencing uh, problems with um, penalties and also in the area of change in ownership um, as to being reset, reassessed um, after a property was transferred from their family members. Uh, and we also saw another um, with uh, delinquent taxes. In um, one case, after the taxpayer received a penalty because her online payment did not go through, we contacted the tax collector's office um, for information to, on why uh, the penalty was applied or why the payment was rejected. We then discussed um, with the taxpayers some ideas about what information they could submit to the tax collector's office um, to support penalty cancellation. Um, and we also provided that taxpayer with a point of contact in the tax collector's office that they could uh, call directly to discuss the matter. Um, in the end, um, they did uh, receive a penalty cancellation um, that was approved by the tax collector. So that was very beneficial to the taxpayer. Uh, in another case, the assessor had reassessed property for a change in ownership after um, after a stepfather had um, had given up um, their two children actually a property after he had passed away, and so the Taxpayer Rights Advocate Office uh, helped this taxpayer understand what documents could be submitted um, that would enable the assessor's office to grant the exemption in part. So ultimately, the taxpayer was granted um, the uh, exclusion such that the, the prior owner, which was stepfather, his property tax base, which was much lower than the market value, continued um, for 50% of it. The remaining 50% could not uh, receive that exclusion because it was transferred from a sibling, from the, uh, the, the brother. So a large part of what um, our office does is we help facilitate resolution with problems um, that taxpayers are having. And we do that by working with local property tax agencies, such as the assessor's office and the tax collector's offices to obtain information about the taxpayer's property and, uh, and their taxes. If the issue is, is with a program that our agency administered directly, then we work with our agency's property tax department and divisions on that matter. Oftentimes, um, a taxpayer just needs some assistance in understanding what type of documents can be provided um, so that can they can arrive, arrive at a solution or in other cases um, for us to confirm that they were treated fairly in accordance with the law. So um, in addition to helping taxpayers with specific problems that they are having in the assessment and collection of property taxes, we also help with larger issues that can bring about important change. And that can start with somebody contacting the Taxpayer Rights Advocate Office directly for their help, for our help, or by somebody coming and appearing at the Taxpayer Bill of Rights hearing today. Um, this 2018-19 annual report identifies two projects, one on the assessment appeals pro process and another on the solar energy new construction exclusion that were all brought to the attention before this board at a taxpayer bill of rights hearing. 
Um, so uh, at the 2017 uh, Taxpayer Bill of Rights hearing, the California Alliance of Taxpayer Associations came to the hearing expressing concerns about the assessment appeals process. And as a result, uh, a project was initiated by the property tax department with the project going through the interested parties process. The project resulted in um, property tax rule changes, um, changes to existing guidance in the assessment appeals manual, and also um, a, a new form, the creation of a new form uh, for requests under um, section 441D information requests. That project began in fiscal year 2017-18 with work continuing through the 2019-20 year. It's a comprehensive project and resulted in many very uh, beneficial changes. So, so having your voice heard can, can make a difference. So um, another project was the solar construction energy um, exclusion project. And that was uh, in part due to contacts made to our office in 2018 by a taxpayer representative. That project began in 2018 and it was focused on issues that emerged following our issue, um, our agency's issuance of guidance um, for guidelines for the active solar energy systems new construction exclusion. And um, that project began by addressing reporting requirements and a proposed new uh, property statement reporting form for uh, solar energy power plant equipment. So uh, next, I would like to point out uh, an educational resources worked on by the Taxpayers uh, Rights Advocate Office, and that is discussed in the Taxpayer Service Improvement Area. Uh, they are short information sheets that are written in simple, non-technical terms to help taxpayers understand various property tax topics. Um, there are three information sheets that are discussed uh, in the report. They are listed. Um, they provide information on property tax exclusions. One addresses property tax uh, property transfers for the parent child and another for the grandparent child. And the third is for the transferring of a base year value for persons over age 55 under Revenue and Taxation Code Section 69.5. Um, the information sheets are a resource for taxpayers where they can read about the main requirements, how they can apply for them, helpful hints on the topic, and where to find additional information. With that information disseminated, it helps reduce the number of taxpayers that are having for this uh, types of transfers that the problems that they may have. So it's a, a valuable resource for them. Um, so for today's Bill of Rights hearing, we were notified of seven speakers prior to the hearing. Um, I'll go ahead and list them. Um, and then um, and then we can proceed uh, with that. So the first speaker uh, and actually second. So we have Mr. Thomas Crandall and Mr. Robert McKee. They both submitted comments on the same topic and have asked that their comments be uh, be read, which were submitted on form 1373, the taxpayer rights advocates hearing appearance sheet. The second or the third, excuse me, um, is Mr. Sean Mooney, who submitted comments by email and asked that his comments uh, that were sent by email be read for the record. Um, Mr. Paul Ballard, who submitted comments on Form 1373, indicated he would be speaking before this board today by teleconference. And um, the next speaker will be uh, Ms. Sherry Evans, with Evans and Rosen Attorneys at Law out of Berkeley, and she indicated she would be speaking before this board today by teleconference. The next speaker uh, is uh, Ms. Kathleen Blackwell, who submitted comments by email and asked that they be read into the record. And the seventh speaker, uh, which came in um, not to uh, a few, maybe an hour before the meeting today, um, is identified as SCC assessor employee. So um, 
it wasn't clear if they plan to speak by teleconference. If not, then their comments will be read. So um, I am finished with my remarks. And uh, unless there are any questions from the, the board members, we can begin the taxpayer comments, starting with the speakers who notified the Advocates Office or proce Board Proceedings Division in advance that they like would like to speak. Um, and uh, we appreciate everyone joining us for the first virtual Taxpayer Bill of Rights hearing. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Is that Ms. Yes, it is. Yes. Ms. Thompson, good morning to you. I was wondering, um, this is this body, this board's second Taxpayer Bill of Rights hearing and process that we've gone through. Um, no, actually, yeah, it's our second. Or is it our third? Second or third, I can't recall. Either way, uh, I was wondering if you're no. starting to see sure. uh, see a trend or if there's some kind of theme and what the taxpayer taxpayers um, are questions that they're raising or issues that they're dealing with. So um, we are contacted in our office by uh, really a, a wide range of um, of taxpayer taxpayer issues. Um, we do see trends uh, in the area uh, or recurring items, I, I suppose, that are problems. And a lot of them do have what have to do with uh, family transfers, and um, because oftentimes what happens is when uh, somebody passes away, their parents, uh, grandparents, then they pass property on to their children, and the parent-child transfer. Uh, there are, you know, exclusions from reassessment that are available by law, but there are requirements that have to take place in order for the taxpayer to get that. So. Um, and it and had the timing has to be right. So um, oftentimes we see that taxpayers, when they inherit property, they don't keep it for various reasons or another, and they sell it. Now, unfortunately, um, in order to receive the parent-child transfer exclusion, you have to file the claim before you sell the property to a third party. And and we do see that unfortunately happening a lot. Um, and and uh, there is nothing that can be done unless that claim form was filed. So, um, so that's important. But otherwise, there's a, a fairly long period of time where people can apply for that in three years. So interesting. I think yeah. you, you you point out kind of where there's a gap, right? A gap in knowledge. You know that there's mm -hmm. paperwork that needs to be filed and the taxpayer doesn't know that. What can we do as a body, as a board of equalization, to try to fill and educate that gap so that property people who inherit property know that prior to selling um, the inherited property that they actually have, you know, a responsibility to fill out and file the paperwork. Any ideas on how we can be a little bit more efficient in that area? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you for that, uh, Board Member Cohen. So we, um, so we have, we try to develop the the these information sheets, kind of based on the uh, the taxpayer concerns that we see, and so that's why we did issue one for the on the parent child transfer, as well as the grandparent child transfer, uh, and then on. Um, on the on trans, base your value transfers for P, age 55 and over. We also have seen some problems in the area of disabled veterans uh, exemptions. And so that is actually on our plan to do. And um, so I really appreciate you bringing that up. Um, the other area uh, where, because it is more in the case of death, and we have been thinking about that in our office, um, rather than having a topic just like on parent-child transfer, but maybe a topic on um, on property tax implications and things that you need to keep in mind when there is a death of a real property owner. So I think that's what we are going to explore next um, and talk with the assessors association, uh, you know, about that if if they're they see an interest in and in educating their taxpayers on that. So that would kind of bring that more to the attention, I think, of a wider base of taxpayers because then they're thinking of it more in terms of you know, someone passed away and what do you have to do, you know, to accomplish certain things on property taxes? And that, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair, I have no questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Other members? I think I heard. Chair Vasquez, this is uh, Member Gaines. Go ahead. 
Yeah, thank you. I do have uh, some questions and uh, appreciate um, Member Cohen's comments. I uh, agree with those and want to make sure that we provide simplic simplicity and clarity uh, for our constituents when it comes to trying to determine um, taking action, whether it's um, change of ownership on a pro property through family or, or any other issue. And um, I, I had an issue with a constituent uh, that had to do with the valuation of a property. Um, and there was a challenge to the valuation. And I'm just wondering if we could educate uh, maybe through another letter um, or communication that's available on our website uh, to property owners on if you believe that a property value is not accurate, how do you go through challenging it? Uh, explaining the process of uh, the use of the Assessment Appeals Board. Um, and actually, in addition to that, I um, I would like uh, the board to take a look uh, at, and we'll have to see what our jurisdiction is here, but I have some challenges with some of these assessment boards uh, that are actually represented by the Board of Supervisors in a particular county. I think there's an inherent conflict of interest there when there's a, there's a benefit to the Board of Supervisors on increasing values uh, because that brings in more more revenue into that particular county. And uh, it seems to me that that ought to be at arm's length and that there ought to be at a minimum appointed uh, individuals that would serve on a assessment appeals board. And, um, and then finally, um, you know, to what degree can we intervene and help someone if they feel like their property valuation is inaccurate? Um, I had a situation uh, with a constituent that had to go to court in order to get the proper valuation. And that is going through the process uh, with the judge asking questions on how the uh, property valuation was determined. And, it, and the judge was challenging as to whether it had been done in a fair manner. And so they're going through that process. But it um, seems to me we we shouldn't have to have a constituent go through the courts. And if we have a taxpayer rights advocate, uh, can't we uh, help in determining, um, you know, equal application of the law? We are the board of equalization uh, when people are questioning the valuation of their property. So those, those are my points and I, I don't know if this uh, should be directed. I think it should be directed to Brenda, uh, uh, Brenda Fleming, our executive director. Uh, but I'd sure like to dig into that um, more deeply and um, would love to have this come back forward uh, to our board so that we can have a discussion on it. Thank you, Mr. Gaines. I'd be happy to take note of that one. Thank you. Great, thank you. And also, um, I think that's an excellent idea. Thank you for that suggestion, board member Gaines. Um, I think having an information sheet on um, what to do uh, if you disagree with your assessed value is, is a good good idea. So I'll, I'll write that down and, and put that on our to-do list. Thanks. Great, thank you. Chairman Vasquez? Yes, is that, uh, is that Yvette, I hear? Yes, yes it is, thank you, sir. I want to go back to the parent-child, grandparent-child exclusion and the various fact sheets that's been developed. I'm just curious, Ms. Thompson, I, I know that they're on the BOE website and I know that you share them with the assessors. Um, are they being shared with any other third parties? So um, we, we have them posted under the Taxpayer Bill of Rights uh, area um, under taxpayer education, so it's fairly prominent. Um, we could also um, kind of, we were hoping to get, um, have a little further along some more, but I think after we issue the fourth information sheet, our office plans to do a letter to assessor so that will re reach a, a broader audience in that, in that respect. Um, and the other idea actually um, is as part of this Taxpayer Bill of Rights, we reached out to several uh, taxpayer organizations to for them and asked them if they could notify their membership of um, of this taxpayer bill of rights hearing. So that is an idea that we could do is um, we could actually 
email uh, a request for for these taxpayers uh, associations to notify their members. So Caltax, um, Society of Enrolled Agents, um, Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association, Cal CPA, Cal Chamber, and that would get the word out. So I think that I appreciate a way to you do getting it. the word out, Ms. Thompson. I appreciate you getting the word out regarding the um, the here the annual meeting. Mm -hmm. but I was really focusing more on the forms. And I understand that they're on our website, but uh, it might be a little passive. Mm -hmm. So I would like to suggest that um, you look into sharing those forms with different organizations and associations that are dealing with real estate, such as the um, mm -hmm. California Realtor Association, okay. California Bar, since it's a legal transaction, mm -hmm. and also um, not to um, stereotype, but most often when property is being passed on, you have an older person. So maybe AARP, you can share the information that way. Mm -hmm. So that it's been shared broadly. Okay, thank you for that. Yes, yeah, so I'll we'll do that. So in addition to the same parties that we notified about this hearing, because they do have a, no, a, a wide uh, and large taxpayer base, we'll reach out um, and let the California realtors know, uh, California State Bar, uh, and then and then we'll also contact AARP and, and I'll kind of think about some other ideas. And if any of the members have any suggestions, uh, if they want, you know, want to let me know, then then we can do that after the meeting. So great. We'll, we'll be happy to share that. We, we want as many people as possible to know about them. So, I, I agree with uh, Ms. Towers, actually, and I'm glad you brought it up, Ms. Towers. I think that the, the strategy is a little bit passive and that we need to be more aggressive and more thoughtful and strategic. Um, partnering with assessor's offices, partnering with funeral homes, quite possibly, people that are dealing, um, um, attorneys that are dealing with trusts um, and, um, and and putting these things together just so that they have the most accurate and current information. The irony is, is that, as you know, there's a ballot initiative that's going to be also tweaking um, possibly this transfer, the rules around transferring uh, uh, grandparent to child and child grand child, parent to child uh, transfers so it seems like we really need to be thoughtful I don't know if it's a public service announcement uh, if it's a social media campaign I don't know Ms. Tom there is a budget for this but this seems to be our bread and butter and in terms of our responsibility as members of the Board of Equalization um, to do our due diligence and to be aggressive um, in our dissemination of information and also being no, mind, mind, no, noting that the information needs multiple languages and we shouldn't just restrict ourselves into just an, an English presentation. So it sounds like we have an opportunity to really build a nice, um, I don't know if it's marketing, but certainly a, a, a campaign of sorts, an information campaign to let people know what their options are so that they can make the most informed decisions for themselves. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Thompson. Thank so, you. Vice Chair Schaefer here. Yes, go ahead, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to second uh, Member Cohen's uh, recommendations and, and I do want to be available to work with whoever's going to be working on this field with uh, our taxpayer rights advocate. Uh, she mentioned uh, the state bar and uh, state realtors. I want to point out that there are very strong county level bar associations, San Diego County Bar, Los Angeles County Bar, San Francisco County Bar, Sacramento County Bar. I would think that we should also reach out to the county bar associations in our more populous counties because they do have a lot of uh, continuing education of the bar. and. Whoever deals with such things as property transfer should get a little warning from us that they need to take care of the transfer tax benefits prior to sale of the property. And uh, as long as we let them know uh, that that's on our mind too, uh, I think that's part of our due diligence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just had a couple of quick questions, uh, but I do agree with my colleagues as well. And thank you for your comments and suggestions. I think they were well thought out. Uh, and I just wanted to thank Ms. Thompson for this report. You know, I always kind of look forward to this because it's kind of 
this is the report that kind of looks at the big picture and, and gives us that that overall overview of really what we're all, the Board of Equalization is all about, the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. Uh, and I wanted to first just uh, comment and, you know, going to, I guess it was page 12 of the report, I was happy to see that uh, looks like we we went a little above, above and beyond in terms of our website. I understand now the website has been translated into Spanish, Chinese, and Tagalog. I wanted to commend you for that. But I was wondering on the informational sheets that we have, those publications, are those available in other languages as well? Um, I, so page 12 on the it's Taxpayer report. Bill of Rights uh, hearing, yeah, the annual report. So there's a couple of areas, actually, the Taxpayer Service Improvements area um, talks about our, our, basically the Taxpayer Rights Advocate Office, but it also tax call, talks about um, the service improvements that have been made by other by county assessors statewide, and they submit comments to us. We solicit um, information from county assessors each year for the annual report if they would like to submit some input, and we provide that. And that uh, on page 12 that's talking about that language, that actually is discussing um, you know what 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 the San Francisco uh, city and county did because they have such a wide diverse that having information and workshop shops in some of the other languages uh, pertains to um, to their county. It's um, and if you're looking at the 1819 um, taxpayer rights advocate annual report. So um, we don't uh, unfortunately we don't have information in other languages on our website. So there are some um, residential property appeals. Uh, I know publications that are in some other language as well. But um, I think our agency has been kind of discussing that in, internally. Oh, okay, okay. well, then I would like to just remind uh, you again and see what oh. we can do. Uh, you know, that I think yes. that would be great. And maybe take that as an example. Let's take a look at what they're doing. Because when I was looking through it, I thought that was great. Uh, especially as we're talking about, you know, how do we do a better job of getting the word out and outreach into all these right. respective groups, right? Right. We would have to kind of discuss that too with um, county assessors because um, the information that we provide on our information sheet, it refers to forms. I mean, it generally it will always, there will always be an application form that is made and it is submitted to a county assessor's office where that property is located. Um, so, so that would involve, ha even if we were able to convert that to another language, then they won't, the assessor's office wouldn't have the uh, ability to handle that form. So that would have to be discussed amongst um, county assessor's office as well as with the board. So I'll speak with the executive director about that. Um, thank you. I appreciate it. And then I, my last question is, you know, in light of COVID-19 restrictions, and the upcoming legislation coming down the pipeline, such as split row, uh, is the TRA office ready or have, do they have the capacity to take on additional calls and inquiries by the general public? Yeah, um, we would see, uh, I think, increases in the number of calls that and contacts that we receive um, just because a lot more properties would be assessed at market value. They're not protected anymore by Prop 13. So we would receive calls uh, in that in that area. Um, we would need additional staffing um, and we would be requesting uh, that. And also we um, we would be indicating what would be involved with an implementation plan such as that, because we would need to be, uh, you know, get up to speed on uh, on the the constitutional amendment, what it actually involves, and the implementation phases of it. So, yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, those are those are my thoughts, uh, Ms. Davis. Did we have some? public comments on this? I believe we did. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, we'd like to first go to Henry Nanjo, Acting Chief of Board Proceedings, 
and Lisa Renetti, Deputy Chief of Board of Equalization, to read the public comments that we've received thus far. Mr. Nanjo, Ms. Renetti, are you available? Yes, we are set. Thank you very much, Ms. Davis. The first public comment is from Thomas P. Crandall. Uh, quote, this 2020 taxpayer rights hearing issue is the same unaddressed, unresolved property tax policy issue presented by the taxpayers and tabled, set aside by the board chairman at both the 2018 and 2019 taxpayer rights hearings. The policy issue, colon, um, assessor's disregard of a real property conveyance, paren, an operative public record deed, close paren, taxpayer position per presented by Crandall to the board at 2018 taxpayer rights hearing via BOE 1373 dated 8-21-18. A taxpayer position presented by Crandall to the board at the 2019 taxpayer rights hearing via BOE 1373 dated 8-27-2019 and again in 2020. I present herein the taxpayer citizen position regarding the enrollment of public record legal title real property, colon, the civil code establishes the right of any person to convey real property as attended. Civil code sections 671, 1039, 1105, civil code section 1217.2. The tax lien securing local real property tax revenue requires the enrollment of legal title parcels. RTC section 2187, RTC section 405, paren A, close paren, um, Three, the assessor must enroll real property according to legal title ownership to preserve the tax lien, RTC section 405, paren A, RTC section 2187. Four, the BOE legal department erroneously advocates an assessor may disregard the conveyance of a legal title, a public record deed. Um, CLD 2017-1, 11 April 2017, Paren Yim, Yim letter to Crandall, uh, 722 2015. Um, five, taxpayers have repeatedly requested the BOE convene an interested parties meeting to resolve this BOE policy issue. Taxpayer appeared and contested this erroneous policy at the 2018 and 2019 taxpayer rights hearings. Six, the board. Uh, the BOE board members, chairperson, have failed to address this taxpayer rights and revenue security issue at the 2018 hearing. Chairperson George Runner tabled this taxpayer issue and then failed to investigate. At the 2019 hearing, Chairperson Malia Cohen uh, tabled this taxpayer issue and then failed to investigate. A suggestion by State Controller Stowers to convene an interested parties meeting was tabled by Chair Cohen. Taxpayer provided issues to Cohen assigned staff John Thiella. Cohen results equal nothing. No investigation, no report. Seven, the resolution of this fundamental policy issue remains unaddressed before the full board. The, quote, Bureau, unquote, refuses to clarify its ambiguous enrollment policy that violates taxpayer rights and revenue and security requirements. Long distance taxpayer appearances before the board in, Sac uh, paren, in Sacramento at a significant taxpayer expense, un, uh, close paren, have proved unproductive. Future taxpayer travel to resolve this policy issue deserves required unbiased, transparent, and competent BOE counterparts. Eight, taxpayers slash citizens request the board direct the Bureau to hold an enrollment of legal title interested parties meeting. This interested parties meeting to be chaired without bias by the property tax department. Representatives from the taxpayers Crandall and McKee and state controller tax, uh, paren tax collectors to be included as interested parties said meeting to be scheduled convened soon as soon as possible after COVID-19 restrictions have abated. Nine, as elevated to the board, taxpayers require a board response to this property taxpayer bill of rights request for assistance. And that's the end of the comment. Uh, the next comment, it will be re read by Ms. Uh, Renati. And Ms. Renati. May I, um, Henry? Yes. Can I go ahead and I was going to provide some comments in response to each oh, speaker. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. So, sure, sorry um, about that, Lisa. That's okay. So um, Mr. Crandall appeared at last year's Taxpayer Bill of Rights hearing um, in 2019 
as indicated um, in the remarks that were submitted um, for this year, he disagrees with the BOE's legal um, department's position that an assessor may determine that the owner uh, whose name on a deed is not the beneficial owner of the property. And he believes that the matter was unaddressed and unresolved. But the Taxpayer Rights Advocate Office has worked with Mr. Crandall at various times to address his concerns since he first appeared at the 2014 Taxpayer Bill of Rights hearing. From July 2014 through February 2017, our legal department has written him, him six uh, separate legal uh, letters to Mr. Crandall reiterating the same answer to his questions. Um, Basically, that an assessor may legally dis, uh, excuse me, may legally determine that the owner of legal title is not the beneficial owner of the property. Um, and so, Mr. Crandall disagrees with that legal department's uh, opinion. Before the 2018 Taxpayer Bill of Rights hearing, our office worked with Mr. Crandall on questions he had to ensure that his questions weren't different than the past. And um, we coordinated with our legal department um, who then wrote and then we wrote a letter to Mr. Crandall um, in July 2018 responding to Mr. Crandall's questions that were posed to us. Um, and then at the 2018 Taxpayer Bill of Rights hearing, Mr. Mr. Crandall had expressed concerns about our legal department's position and former uh, board member George Runner having thought it was an old legal opinion. Uh, had requested our office work with the executive director and uh, the legal department to potentially agendize that matter. And so our office coordinated with the chief counsel on that. Um, and then um, what we did is we, um, after consulting with them, we determined that the issues and concerns raised had already been addressed uh, in multiple legal department letters um, since 2002. And although the original opinion was issued many years ago in 2002, that subject has been addressed in um, more recent years. So a significant amount of time has been spent by uh, the legal department and our office and our agency has responded numerous times. Unfortunately, Mr. Crandall doesn't agree with our agency's position. Um, our understanding is that from the legal department's position uh, is that it's based on provisions of the evidence code and the civil code. And unless those laws change, the legal department's position can't change. The Taxpayer Rights Advocate Office is unable to do anything more for Mr. Crandall, but we certainly appreciate his comments. That concludes my remarks for this speaker, and unless there are any uh, comments from the board members, we'll proceed to the next speaker, which is on the same subject. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Renato, is there any other public comments? Yes, Ms. Renati, Ms. Renati will read the next one. Thank you. This comment is from Robert McKee. This 2020 Taxpayers Rights Hearing issues the same unaddressed, unresolved property tax policy issue presented by taxpayers and tabled, set aside by the board chairman at both the 2018 and 2019 Taxpayers Rights Hearings. The policy issue, assessor's disregard of a real property conveyance, an operative public record deed. Taxpayer position provided by McKee to board at 2018 Taxpayers Rights Hearing via McKee letter to Thompson dated 8-9-2018. Taxpayer position presented by McKee to board at 2019 Taxpayers' Rights Hearing regarding McKee letter to Cohen dated 4-1-2019. Again, in 2020, I present herein the taxpayer citizen position regarding the enrollment of public record legal title real property. The Civil Code establishes the right of any person to convey real property as intended. Civil Code Section 671-1039-1105 and 1217. The tax lien securing local real property tax revenue requires the enrollment of legal title parcels. Revenue and Taxation Code 2187, Revenue and Taxation Code 405A. Number three, the assessor must enroll real property according to legal title ownership to preserve the tax lien. RTC Code 405A, RTC Code 2187. Number four, the BOE legal department erroneously advocates an assessor may disregard a conveyance of legal title, a public record deed, CLD 2017-1, 11 April 2017, 
Yim, letter to Crandall, 7-22-2015. Number five, taxpayers have repeatedly requested that the BOE convene an interested parties meeting to resolve this BOE policy issue. Taxpayers appeared and contested this erroneous policy at the 2018 and 2019 taxpayers' rights hearings. Number six, the BOE board members, chairperson, have failed to address this taxpayer rights and revenue security issue. At 2018 hearing, Chairperson George Runner tabled this taxpayer issue and then failed to investigate. At 2019 hearing, Chairperson Malia Cohen tabled this taxpayer issue and then failed to investigate. A suggestion by State Controller Stowers to convene an interested parties meeting was tabled by Chair Cohen. Taxpayers provided issue details to Cohen, assigned staff John Thiela. Results equal nothing. No investigation or report. Number seven, the resolution of this fundamental policy issue remains unaddressed before the full board. The Bureau refuses to clarify its ambiguous enrollment policy that violates taxpayers' rights and revenue security requirements. Long-distance taxpayer appearances before the board in Sacramento at significant taxpayer effort have proven unproductive. Future taxpayer travel to resolve this issue, policy issue rather, deserves, requires unbiased, transparent, and competent BOE counterparts. Taxpayers, citizens, request the board direct the Bureau to hold an enrollment of legal title interested parties meeting. This interested parties meeting to be chaired without bias by the property tax department. Representatives from the taxpayer, Crandall and McKee, and state controller, tax collectors, to be included as interested parties. Said meeting to be scheduled, convened as soon as possible after COVID-19 restrictions have abated. Number nine. As elevated to the board, taxpayers require a board response to this property taxpayer's Bill of Rights request for assistance. And that completes the comments. Uh, this is Vice Chair Schaefer. I have a comment. Go ahead, Mr. Schaefer. Uh, I'd like to ask Mr. Nanjo, uh, is there any length to the uh, presentations that are given to you to read into the record? What if somebody gives you a 20 or 30 page document? Uh, uh, can we uh, suggest that there should be a limit of two pages of copy or not more than 500 words uh, in an expression without leave of, uh, of the chair? That'd be question one. And question two, uh, should we be sitting here in judgment of what Ms. Stowers and Ms. Cohen uh, uh, may have done last year? Or, or uh, I would think when they're through with the... Uh, BOE and not happy with what happened, maybe their next recourse should be to the civil courts. Uh, um, uh, I don't know that we're going to live long enough to keep uh, rehashing uh, decisions that we made last year. Uh, could you comment on those two before we proceed? Hello, Mr. Nanjo? Did I lose somebody? I hear you. I, I'm waiting to see if Mr. Nanjo's available. Sorry, sorry about that. I had a uh, technical difficulty. Oh. Um, so, uh, Vice Chair Schaefer, to answer your questions on the first one, um, there is the, the chairman has set a limit on public comments of three minutes. Um, Ms. Renati and I are trying our best to read the comments within three minutes. If they cannot be read within three minutes, or we, we, we give them a few seconds either end of that, but if they can't be read in three minutes, we will do our best to read the first three minutes of comments, and then the rest will be posted on the official record of the website um, and, and uh, with the official record of the minutes. On your second question... Thank um, you. That's a good answer. We didn't know that before. Now proceed, please. Sure. On your second question, yes, you are correct. Um, the remedy for the, any individuals can always seek um, redress in civil courts or other places. But at the same time, unfortunately, under Bagley Keene, or fortunately under Bagley Keene, as your point of view may be, uh, they are always welcome to make public comments. So um, the, the board's obligation is to just hear out the public comments. And if the board believes they have taken appropriate action, that's all the board needs to do. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Thompson, do okay. you want to respond to any of those? Yes, I do. Thank you. Um, so Mr. McKee's comments are the same as that of Mr. Crandall, who also submitted comments for today's Taxpayer Bill of Rights hearing. 
Mr. McKee appeared together with, with Mr. Crandall at last year's 2019 Taxpayer Bill of Rights hearing, um, supporting Mr. Crandall's position. Similar to Mr. Crandall's remarks, uh, Mr. McGee disagrees with the BOE legal department's position that an assessor may determine that the owner of um, the property, uh, excuse me, the owner, the basically the owner whose name that appears on the deed may not be the beneficial owner of the property. Mr. McGee's comments indicate that he submitted a letter for the 2018 taxpayer uh, Bill of Rights hearing via letter to me in August 2018, but our records indicate that he did not provide or submit comments for that Bill of Rights hearing, um, but we did receive a letter following um, that hearing uh, dated September 19, 2018 from Mr. McKee expressing support for Mr. McKee's, or excuse me, for Mr. Crandall's position uh, and his desire to be placed on distribution for a special uh, uh, hearing list if that occurred. Um, as indicated in my prior remarks from Mr. Crandall, the Taxpayer Rights Advocate Office had coordinated with the legal department on, his, on the concerns that were raised uh, and then sent a letter to Mr. Crandall in December 2018 explaining that that, um, that was determined uh, that the issues and concerns raised had all been addressed in multiple legal opinions before. So we certainly appreciate Mr. McKee's comments. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Davis, do we have any other public comments in the queue? Yes, sir. We do have several other comments that um, need to be read into the record um, by both Mr. Nanjo and Mr. Ren Ms. Renati. Um, are you prepared to continue? Yes, the next uh, com public comment is by Sean Mooney, and Ms. Renati will read his comment. This comment is from Sean Mooney. Proceeding Clerk Henry Nanjo, as a reasonable accommodation, please have my public comments read into the meeting record. Sean Mooney, 817-2020, Tax Advocate Lisa Thompson, Special Topic Surveys, authorized by Sections 15640 and 15643 of the Government Code, are conducted as needed. Attaches the April 2000 BOE Special Topic Survey on Possessory Interest. This 20-year-old special survey is outdated and needs to be up, up, undated. The focus of this taxpayer complaint is stadium naming rights and whether they are uniformly taxable interest statewide. Further, when naming rights are sold on public land, does the name change trigger a change in ownership and reassessment? To illustrate and demonstrate this complaint, by example, the SF Giants stadium naming rights have changed four times in 20 years. Originally named Pacific Bell Park, then SBC Park, then AT&T Park, the stadium's current name, Oracle Park, was adopted in 2019. More than 200 million Oracle Corporation, the world's second largest software make it, maker, paid for naming rights to AT&T Park. None of these four naming rights have a tax ID number and not enrolled on the tax rolls, and the landlord for the Port of San Francisco does not report to the possessory interest to the assessor on BOE 502P or any equivalent reporting method. Notable, the Warrior basketball team moved to San Francisco in 2019, yet the new stadium arena naming rights, Chase Center, is not enrolled on the tax rolls. Tax advocate Lisa Thompson, since April 2000, when the special topic survey was published, naming rights have become big business. Since April 2000, naming rights of professional sports arena and stadiums have greatly expanded into colleges and university stadiums and arena that are located on public land and not enrolled on the local tax rolls. Tax advocate Lisa Thompson, the April 2000 special topic survey on possessory interest and naming rights being a taxable possessory interest is not clear or uniform throughout the state, thereby causing confusion and escaped assessments name statewide. Stadium or arena naming rights. Generally speaking, a naming right is a contractual right held by a corporation or other legal entity to attach its name or trade name to a specific stadium, arena, or other type of real property, typically for marketing purposes. Whether naming rights in publicly owned stadiums or arenas arenas constitute taxable possessory interest has not been addressed legislatively or in the courts. However, the position that billboard rights, i.e. signage rights, on publicly owned property are taxable possessory interests is generally accepted. When a company pays a property owner for the use of his or her property as an advertising billboard, the payment is for a right to use real property. The fact that the property in question may be a sports stadium or arena is irrelevant. Further, if the property is publicly owned, such as a right constitutes a taxable possessory interest, the questionnaire asked if naming rights in publicly owned stadiums or arenas was considered when valuing taxable possessory interests, question 25. 
Of the 52 reporting counties, 41 county assessors indicated that no such interests exist in their counties. Six county assessors reported that they do not consider such interests, and five county assessors indicated that they do not consider naming rights when valuing stadium taxable possessory interests. That concludes the comment from Mr. Mooney. Mr. Nanjo, are you prepared to read the next comment? Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and comment. read. I'm actually going to comment now. Sorry. So, Go ahead. so, so Mr. Mooney's comments that were uh, that were submitted concern stadium naming rights. He indicates that he believes naming rights of professional sports arenas and stadiums have expanded greatly in the last 20 years um, since the time of that special topic survey on the assessment of taxable possessory interest was issued. He indicates that it isn't clear that naming rights are taxable uh, possessory interest, thus causing confusion and escape assessment statewide. Um, Mr. Mooney has submitted comments for the past two taxpayer bill of rights hearing expressing concerns regarding the assessment of taxable possessory interest and our office worked with him in the past and provided written responses to Mr. Mooney uh, addressing his past concerns. More recently, we had explained to him that uh, form BOE 502P, which covers the reporting requirement of revenue and taxation code section 480.6 is a form to be completed by a government property owner and not the taxpayer that is using the property. Um, although the topic of Mr. Mooney's uh, concern is possessory interest, similar to past concerns that he has had, um, our office has not specifically looked into the extent of guidance our agency has uh, regarding naming rights or laws that address that. So our office is happy to look into this matter further and provide a response to Mr. Mooney. That concludes uh, my remarks for this speaker. Thank you. Ms. Davis, I think we have other public comment, right? Yes, sir. We have several other comments that will continue to be read by Mr. Nanjo and Ms. Renati. Go ahead. Thank you, Ms. Davis. The next comment is from Paul C. Ballard. Um, quote, Leisure World Seal Beach, it's 16 California Seal Beach Leisure World Mutual Corporations and many other senior communities use stock as ownership versus a deed. All homes are bought for cash, no financing allowed, therefore a 100% equity from day one. Homes, friend, ours and others, close friend, are taken by less scrupulous mutual corporate lawyers evicting seniors from their fully paid for homes in the unlawful detainer slash rental uh, courts onto the street using assessor's office lack of real APN on public tax roll. This real property ownership stock is not a publicly recorded document as our deed, a deed is. OC assessor issues fictitious APNs on supplemental tax roll not readily available to the public or the real estate industry. The property owner has no mechanism to pay their own assessed property taxes independently outside of the corporation mutual. This has developed into a situation allowing quote, quote, crooks, unquote, to steal fully paid for homes, evicting seniors on their or their heirs, claiming a, quote, tax foreclosure, unquote, as the stated reason to have the assessor's office transfer the ownership of real property for in the home. Um, there is also potential tax fraud by selling the now taken home for le far less than market value, reissuing stock and reselling the homes and profiting the difference. Our home was, quote, sold, unquote, as an inside sale, not on the public market to a contractor for about the land value. He then remodeled it and resold it a profit issuing new its share of stock. All in corporation with Leisure World, the Seal Beach Mutual Corporation, and the management company, i.e. Golden Rain Foundation. OC Assessor Office claims they are following the, quote, law, unquote, as per BOE documents provided to me by the OC Assessor's Office. Where are the protections and safeguards to senior homeowners, the actual owners and taxpayers? No recorded documents to transfer ownership fictitious APN, no title search or title insurance possible, no clean title possible, illegal abuse of the 1986 California Davis-Sterling Act and current law, in my opinion. Additionally, without a valid real APN, the senior slash homeowners have no access to their 100% equity under federal law. 
There are tens of thousands of senior homes in Orange County alone, hundreds of thousands of homes held in California like this, creating the perfect opportunity for crooks to be stealing homes, and they are. End of comment. And I believe, um, actually, um, Mr. Paul Ballard is on the teleconference line. Then he did want to provide comments. So I don't know if the operator can locate him. Mr. Ballard, can I ask that you please press one then zero and I can open up your line, please. While we're waiting, just a friendly reminder, make sure we mute your mics if you're not speaking, members and staff. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good Go morning. Ahead. Yes, good morning. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chairman Vasquez, Vice Chairman Schaefer, and uh, uh, Lisa Thompson. Uh, this is Paul Ballard on the other end of the phone here. As a minor background, I was the past director in the California Association of Realtors, as well as the past president of the County Board of Realtors. So I'm hoping to bring a little edification uh, and rather than just public and personal opinion. Uh, before I go on to the situation of what I brought up, the tragic situation that's happened to our family and many others in Orange County, I would like to make a comment about what I'll refer to as generational transfer outreach that you were discussing earlier. And I very much appreciate the state uh, agency wanting to contact the California Association of Realtors with some sort of a educational pamphlet or outreach but not all, real, not all licensees through the state that sell and transfer real estate are members of the trade association. So you may also want to contact DRE, the Department of Real Estate, since all licensees are through the Department of Real Estate. Some licensees are also a, a members of the trade association, the California Association of Realtors. That being said, um, I would like to go on to to say often I think you probably are hearing taxpayers complain about valuation of taxes. In my particular circumstance and what I've uncovered is the inability to actually pay your taxes. And I tried uh, personally uh, as the trustee of, um, of uh, our home in Leisure World that uh, was under my parents uh, until they um, put it into the trust and, and all the rest. But What's happening is that I, I'll go backwards here after trying to find out what the mechanism was that the lawyers are using to literally take homes at the end of the day. I was provided a document and I've had two conversations with Claude Parrish, the assessor of Orange County and numerous document, numerous conversations and exchange of documents with the uh, senior uh, uh, administrative officials inside the County of Orange Assessor's Office, uh, George Singletary, I believe being the, the top dog regarding those folks. And he's provided me recently with a State Board of Equalization um, direction, and it's dated December 6, 2007. That document number is 2007 forward slash 049. And it's how the, or the, it's a description of how the assessor's office are to be conducting the transfers between properties held in these stock cooperatives. Now, um, it acknowledges, and you don't have to go far, on page one, paragraph three, it acknowledges that they really don't have any proof or, or verification of who owns what. In our particular case, I can tell you the, the scenario when my mom passed away in 2012, and somewhere I ended up with a document, not from the County of Orange, but just an internal document from the Leisure World Golden Rain Management Company. And it's referred to it as the Wanda S. Ballard Estate. That would have been my mother's name, except that all of this should have been in the trust prior. Under any event, I went to the county and I said exactly how, I went to the assessor's office in Santa Ana, and I said exactly how did somebody other than myself, how were they changing transfer of the title uh, to this? It was explained because there is no deed, uh, they have no recorded documents, and that the president had called the county assessor's office and it changed the transfer. Now, I glibly said, oh, Obama called? And they laughed and they said, no, no, it was a, it was a lady, her name was Joyce. I said, Joyce Rutledge. So you're telling me 
that the volunteer homeowner association president, who is no more or less uh, uh, an owner down the down the road, can call the assessor's office and change ownership title. And it turns out that is what is accurate under this document that has been issued as the instructions to the assessor's office as to how they're to be changing titles. And uh, it, it was created under Assembly Bill 402, Section 408.8. And if this is truly the case, um, there is a chink in the, in the uh, checks and balances armor that you can sail the Queen Mary through. And something needs to be done because we are the Ballard family is not a unique case. This goes on all the time. In fact, the lawyers in Orange County Court, they stated so um, to the judge on the transcript. They do it all the time. And I know they are. I was there taking care of my parents and I was watching it happen. My background as a realtor uh, in the in the real estate industry, when I got to there to take care of my parents, I was watching what was happening and I was just shocked and dismayed. Now, the reality why you haven't heard about this so much in the past is, bluntly, dead people don't talk. And the heirs, for the most part, have no idea. And it all looks all nice and legal. I question whether it is. And uh, I, I, I'm convinced it's not. But the mechanism of which it's being utilized is something that is, is taking place. And that's what I was starting to focus on. And when I was at the the taxpayers, excuse me, the uh, uh, assessor's office last week, I noticed the flyer for this event today uh, up on the window, the public window. And I called and I got a wonderful Miss Lisa Thompson on the phone. And she then encouraged me to fill out that form. I apologize on that form. I just sort of made bullet points and it's not easy to read as a narrative paragraph. Um, but there's a serious problem going on, at least inside the County of Orange, regarding seniors and stock cooperatives. I've questioned whether it is statewide or whether it is only in the County of Orange. And yet, um, I've been told bluntly by the Orange County officials and the assessor's office that this is a statewide uh, policy of how all of these are handled. I honestly find it hard to believe, but I don't know. Um, I'm hoping that with my presence today and bringing this forward to your attention, that the the issues that were raised in the form, that I'll be able to work with your agency and uh, we'll be able to try to come up with a protection for both seniors and potentially resolve for at least my family or or others in the case. Now, besides the pure taking of our home and then reselling it, and issuing a new share of stock, the the uh, unlucky heir, myself in this case, as the executor of the estate, is awarded the court damages by the judge, and so my personal home has now, and that that exceeds over three hundred thousand dollars in legal fees from these lawyers. So that has now been placed as a tax lien, I mean, not a tax lien, but as a lien on my personal home in Northern California, completely separate and no sense related to the property in Leisure World originally in question, only by me being the legal party for my parents did this take place. Now, at one point, I was trying to figure out the mechanism that Leisure World and that's the marketing term. It's, we're talking the Golden Rain Foundation is the management company, as well as then the Seal Beach Mutuals number one through 16 are the independent for-profit corporations. The Golden Rain Foundation is the nonprofit management company overseeing them that are holding your deeds in trust and only issuing you a share of stock. As far as the county goes, they aren't, they, they are issuing these fictitious parcel numbers, and I can give you ours, and it looks real, and you have APN numbers, and you have documents every now and then from the county, what your tax value is, or your homeowner exemption, or reminding you about such as a, this parental uh, parent transfer, or, or whatever goes out. 
But when it came to those documents come with the county assessor seal on them, and they come to you at your home that you own. But when it comes to the transfer of the ownership, you're not, you're not apprised, you're not aware. That is simply done, I'll say, willy-nilly under the code section that I read from you, or at least the instructions that the county gave to me regarding uh, from, from uh, the, uh, uh, your agency, uh, the Board of Equalization. At least that's what they're claiming they're using. And so I would like to uh, offer any uh, opportunity to ask questions as well as potentially uh, work with uh, Lisa and your agency and your committee to really take a look at this. Uh, uh, when it was uh, uh, an unlawful detainer case is what they use. So you're in unlawful detainer court. In unlawful detainer court, the judge prohibits you to bring up your ownership issues because, after all, why would you be in rental court if you owned the property? And yet I paid taxes on it as the trustee for years and years and years and had all expectation of wanting to sell the property or reside in it. It made no difference. It was on their hit list to take, as they have taken many before us, and they have taken a few that I'm aware of since our case was done in 2016. Um, I'll conclude with, with that, and I would ask if anybody has any questions that I'd be able to uh, address those at this point. And I thank you for your time and uh, your concern and hope we can get to a resolve to protect the citizens. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Ms. Thompson, I'm assuming you wanted to respond to that? Yes, I do. Thank you. Um, Mr. Ballard recently contacted um, our office prior to submitting his comments uh, for the Bill of Rights hearing yesterday. Um, he had told us net last week that he was working with the Orange County Assessor's Office regarding the property and the inability to pay a property tax bill um, because of the form of ownership um, and also that seniors were um, losing their homes. He uh, emailed our office some documents yesterday that we will be examining and working with him to understand the specific circumstances of the situation and how it is related to the assessment and collection of property taxes. Um, this is very upsetting for us to know that this may be affecting seniors, um, putting them out of places to live, um, and we are happy to work with uh, Mr. Ballad on his concerns. Thank you. Member Vasquez, at the appropriate time, Member Gaines would like to ask a question if I could. Sure, go ahead, uh, Mr. Gaines. Yeah, um, Mr. Uh, Ballard, um, I'm just curious, was there um, a sign off? I'm just wondering what the documentation was when you go into Leisure World. Um, did your mom have the understanding that she would not have a deed and that it would be share ownership for? which she could lose her interest in the property. It, it seems, um, I don't know if, it, it, so it sounds to me as if people have not been properly notified uh, through the sales process when they buy into a place like Leisure World. Uh, I've looked at their purchase records. You know, my dad was 80 years old when he purchased the home. Uh, they put it as originally in 1996 as joint tenancy, and in 1999 changed it to the Ballard Family Trust. Uh, the Leisure World documents claim, and I have them, I won't say anything that I can't claim and produce as a document. Being in the former real estate world, nothing matters in verbal, it only matters in writing. That they claim that the house is in the name of the trust. Uh, unfortunately, Apparently, nobody notified the county of that, uh, even though that it's stated repeatedly in Leisure World documents that it's in the name of the trust, although I don't believe that that in and of itself is addressing my particular issue. What I'm trying to bring up, the county is issuing what Claude Parrish, the assessor, referred to as factitious parcel numbers, what George Singletary, the, we'll say, number one guy, uh, referred to as fictitious parcel numbers. I'll go with Claude's take on this. Uh, they exist, but they aren't real. 
and uh, you're given a, a traditional looking APN number, but if you would go into any computer system or any title plant or anything, uh, even the assessor's office, right to the window with the public computers and punch in your assessor's parcel number, no such parcel is found. Wow. Uh, this outrageous. is this is what and this and I believe there are hunt, there's over there's approximately thirty thousand that I know of in the county of Orange, it, just between the two leisure worlds, and there are probably if this is a statewide aspect, there are hundreds of thousands or millions or million or so. I don't know how many people have their parcel held. Yeah, by stock rather than a recorded document, and the County of Orange insists that they cannot put it on the real tax rolls unless it has a uh, recorded deed as the document. And this is what I'm talking about, the chink in the armor to protect the public, let alone the seniors, from, from unscrupulous people. The concept of it, I understand it was okay, but some lawyers have figured out the way to get through this and to politely line their pockets, and they are. Wow, and then you're ending up uh, paying for the legal bill if you challenge it? Yeah, that's correct. That's outrageous. I can't because under that this is happening. I, I'm looking forward to... And uh, it, it, it is yeah. Yeah, um, looking forward to our taxpayer rights advocate, Lisa Thompson, looking into this. And for using the BOE as a rationale to do it, uh, mm -hmm. that uh, is outrageous. It's incredible. So I think we need to really dig in and find out what's going on. And uh, I don't I know if this that. may take um, you know, a statute uh, for remedy or not, maybe legislation. I, I'm just not sure at this point. but. Uh, please dig into it. Let's get the facts and bring this back forward uh, to the board. Thank, thank you. Let, let me let me add to what you what you've just gone. I originally went to at that time Congressman Dana Rohrbacher's office. They had done their own investigation and referred to the as a, a criminal enterprise. He's no longer in office, and uh, Harley Ruda has taken over, and a party change has taken over in Orange County, and he has had an interest and has done something in the congressional record, but his staff has asked me to work with um, State Senator uh, Umberg's office, of which I have made more than one contact, and I have not gotten any response back from them. They, the uh, a Congressman uh, Ruda's office would like this to be a state issue before it turns into a federal issue, and I do understand that. And so when I ran into the poster um, and Lisa had an absolute interest in hearing this story, I'm hoping maybe this agency, this state agency, will do something. So far, the other state agencies that have been apprised of this, including the attorney general or the local county DA or the federal FBI, they claim it's not large enough, it's just small crime, they have no interest even if it is a crime. I've heard everything in the world and much of this is actually in writing. Um, but okay. I personally know of a 70 year old lady after her husband died who was a professor at Princeton and USC, they did, the other ladies didn't like her they took her home, put her on the street, and she's living in a women's shelter is the last that I know. They took everything that they own, and they've done this repeatedly, and somebody's lining their pockets with it, and the people are afraid of talking because they know they're next if they, if they question what's going on. If anything, I'm a younger man and with an educated background in the industry, and I was simply going to be a challenge for their their legal staff, and I don't mean a lawyer, fleets of lawyers. I was attacked by seven lawyers, uh, three different law firms, until they eventually prevailed. Well, I'd like to have Executive Director Fleming, and obviously I want to hear all my board members, but if if we could dig into this and, um, and then follow up uh, with uh, AB 402 and have a clear understanding of that legislation, what, you know, because apparently it it created these uh, stock co-ops that you're talking about, Mr. Ballard. And um, I think we can also uh, follow up um, with um, 
the senator uh, that you had tried to contact if, if um, Executive Director Fleming could follow up. Senator um, that'd be helpful. Yes, Senator um, Senator Umberg's office. There was concept that we may potentially need a legislative amendment. Uh, and that's potentially, I think, why they wanted me to be working with Senator uh, Umberg's office. Um, but under any event, I honestly think under the Davis-Sterling Act, the 1986 body of law, but there's no appellate decision in the states of California to um, uh, verify the Davis-Sterling Act or uphold the Davis-Sterling Act, and the Leisure World legal staff are still using a 1973 Sun Terrace ruling that was bluntly, is my opinion, humble opinion, was overturned by the 1986 Davis-Sterling Act. But since there is no appellate ruling, uh, they are still using this, and it's still being upheld, at least in the Orange County Superior Courts. And once again, my concern is that, that it is far more widespread than just the county of Orange. And I appreciate you folks in a state agency uh, opening up your doors and willing to take a look uh, at what I've un unfortunately uncovered. And this certainly has destroyed my life. Um, and uh, I, I don't want it to be continuing to destroy others. And I personally know that it is. This is an ongoing event by, unfortunately, less than scrupulous lawyers figuring out how to take advantage. They're not taking money or a candy from a baby, they're taking the candy store from the senior. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Ballard. I appreciate it, and uh, we'll follow up on this. Thank, thank you. you. No, thank you. Thank you, thank you sir. Mr. Means, uh, Chair Schaefer, Vice Chair. I think we should weigh in on this, uh, at least see what we can do to, to assist. I mean, God, this it just doesn't sound right. Uh, and I think at the end of the day, if it takes some legislation, we should have staff take a look at that. Uh, Vice Chair Schaefer, I think you had a comment. Yes, this is Vice Chair Schaefer. Mr. Ballard, sir, uh, I am your elected representative for all of Orange County and San Diego and part of San Bernardino County. Uh, uh, and, you know, the buck stops with me on what we're going to be able to do, and I'm appalled at what I'm hearing. I used to own part of a stock co-op when I was a law student at Georgetown. It was called the Senate Apartments, but it was only about 12, 12 different units behind the Supreme Court. Uh, these leisure world properties involve maybe 500 homes, maybe more. Uh, they get to be, you know, uh, uh, such a massive enterprise that, you know, you could call it a criminal enterprise if something's going on. Uh, I do know that when there's uh, improper conduct going on, the good people are scared to death to say anything uh, uh, for fear that they're going to be put into the frying pan next and they can't go hide and ignore it. It's their home that's highly visible. Uh, so I can see that this right. is a problem where the uh, evil is going to triumph if enough good men do nothing. Uh, I appreciate very much what you told me this morning, and I want to pledge my cooperation. I'm going to talk with uh, Ernie Dronenberg, who is an uh, assessor here in San Diego. Uh, I talk frequently with Claude Parrish, and uh, I, I want to find out the extent of these stock co cooperatives, and I'm appalled that there's a... 47-year-old ruling uh, from 1973 that still seems to carry the day. And uh, I would hope that you would uh, include me on your loop whenever you have communications. And Ms. Thompson's very good about what she does. I'm sure she'll let me know what she finds out. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Schaefer. Just for a, a knowledge base, there are over 6,700 homes in the Seal Beach Leisure World, the very first development uh, of its kind, and approximately 22,000 down the road in what is now Leisure World 2, which is now an incorporated city called the City of Laguna Woods. Both, I believe, reside in your district or your territory. Well, Seal Beach, uh, is that in my district or is that in uh, Chair Vasquez's district? Is Seal Beach in Orange County or L.A. County? In Orange. It's Orange. Seal Orange. Beach is the first city, first city of Orange County, uh, south of Long Beach. Okay, I know it was close to Long Beach, and Long Beach is in Chair Vasquez district. So, uh, I will look out for Seal Beach. Thank you, Thank you uh, Vice Chair. Ms. Thompson, did you have any other comments? Um, not for this one. Thank you. 
I'm sorry, we have some background noise going and drilling in the office. So. No I problem. I think we're ready for the next speaker if you are. Thank sure, you. Sure, so go much. ahead, Ms. Davis. Thank you. Yes, um, I'd like to invite Mr. Nanjo or Ms. Renati, if you have any other written comments that need to be read into the record to continue. Uh, we have written comments, Ms. Davis, but I think there's a live uh, speaker who, who is next, uh, Ms. Sherry Evans. If the AT&T operator can locate Ms. Sherry Evans. Ms. Evans, can you please press 1 and 0 so we can open up your line, please? Hi, this is Sherry Evans. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yes. Oh, great. Hello. Um, I'm an attorney who represents nonprofits. My background is primarily in federal tax law and California corporate law. However, I also assist clients with property tax issues, such as the welfare exemption. I have found property tax law to be a confusing and hard to navigate area in part because it includes two regulatory agencies, the BOE and the county assessor. As compared to federal tax law and corporate law, there does not seem to be as much case law and regulatory guidance, which leads to more gray areas. Um, luckily, someone recommended that I contact the Taxpayers' Rights Advocate Office. I am just calling in because I wanted to express my appreciation for the guidance and help that I've received from that office. Um, Ms. Thompson took the time to explain in detail the information I needed to provide to the county assessor and also the process for requesting a legal opinion from the BOE. Because I represent nonprofits, I want to find the most cost-effective path towards resolution. Uh, the Taxpayer Rights Advocate Office has provided this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for those comments, Ms. Evans. Um, our office has worked with Ms. Evans in the past with issues pertaining to the exemptions for nonprofit organizations. And particularly, these are particularly important because they serve um, nonprofit organizations that provide such a valuable resource to different communities in California. And um, we're glad that Ms. Evans has been satisfied with us and we're happy to help her in any future endeavors as well. Thank you. Kudos to Ms. Thompson. Mr. Yes, thank you, Ms. Davis. The next speaker, or the next comment, excuse me, that I am to read is from Kathleen Blackwell. Uh, Ms. Blackwell writes, quote, due to the COVID-19 pandemic and resulting government restriction, emergency restrictions put in place, I was not able to purchase a replacement home and apply for a property tax base year transfer status within the two-year time limit required by law. I was fully aware of my base year transfer deadline date, but the COVID crisis and resulting government restrictions effectively ceased the California economy, paren, and especially the California real estate market, close paren. Suddenly, and, I, and prevented me, paren, and I assume others, close paren, from purchasing a replacement home before the deadline date. This situation was through no fault of my own and was beyond my control. Losing the ability to transfer base year status creates a great financial hardship for me and my family. I am asking for the board to please help me, friend, and other California residents affected, close friend, by exploring all possibilities of relief in this matter, even the possibility of a constitutional amendment to provide limited relief of this situation due to the COVID-19 crisis. An equitable relief would be the extension of the base year transfer deadlines to the date when all emergency government restrictions and orders regarding COVID are lifted plus 180 days from that date. It is only fair and just that those California residents affected not be punished by the COVID-19 pandemic and resulting emergency government orders put in place. I ask the board to please do all you can to help me and the other California residents negatively affected by this situation. Please keep me informed of any progress on this issue. Thank you for your time and attention to this matter. And that concludes her comment. Thank you. Ms. Davis is the others. 
Um, I can provide some comments as well from the taxpayer rights sure, advocate. Thank Thompson. you. Um, so Ms. Um, Blackwell uh, had submitted comments um, and she indicates basically due to COVID-19 pan pandemic that she's not able to purchase or complete her replacement home and apply for a property tax base year value transfer within the two year time uh, period required by law. Um, she's asking that there be an extension of the base year value transfer deadline um, to the date when all emergency government restrictions and orders um, are regarding COVID-19 are, are lifted, plus 180 days. Um, she's also asking that uh, emergency government orders be put in place. This is a very unfortunate situation that, that we're hearing from her. Um, when the governor's order, uh, shelter in place order took place uh, in March of 2020, the property tax department of our agency, as well as our um, agent, or our advocate's office, began to receive calls from taxpayers that were expressing concerns about their being able to complete the house um, construction or purchase a new house following, um, following their sale of their original house within that two year time period. Um, basically, the transfer of the base year value um, was for those that are age 55 and over under Revenue and Taxation Code Section 69.5. So we had looked into the requirements when we were getting all these calls to see if there was uh, any possible extensions for relief that were provided for um, in statute or by regulation. and. Um, we've looked into it um, and found that that two year time limit, which is either two years before or two years after the sale of the original property. So a, a total available of four years, essentially, when you're looking that um, that was in the Revenue and Ta Taxation Code section 69.5, but it was also in the California constitutional provision. So um, that would require um, a constitutional amendment to change that. Um, sec section two of Article 13A of the California Constitution um, expressly provides that that replacement property be purchased uh, within uh, two years of the sale of the original in order to qualify for that reassessment exclusion. So, um, so we appreciate that you know the comments that that we received from Ms. Um, Ms. Blackfell, and certainly uh, feel for the situation. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Ms. The next speaker, uh, excuse me, the next public commenter we have is Ms. Catherine Kramer, and Ms. Lisa Renati will be reading her um, public comment. Uh, August 18, 2020, California Board of Equalization Board meeting subject C, Taxpayers' Rights Hearing Prop 60, two year time extension. I am an over 60 California homeowner seeking help with extending the two year time frame to sell my Oakland home and be able to apply for tax benefits described in Proposition 60. Due to COVID-19, I have experienced an all out stop and now slowdown for being able to find contractors to, to prepare and remodel my home in order to bring it to market within the two years allowed. 2020 has been a very difficult year to proceed with all aspects of my home project. I understand that a constitutional change will be required to increase this time allowance. I assume that when the two-year period was originally accounted for, that amount of time may have seemed doable. Times have changed. I have lived in my 1937-era home for 28 years. It is my first home purchase and has never been remodeled. I could not afford to remodel. With some proceeds, proceeds from my parents' home that was sold in 2016 and lost out on Prop 60 benefits, I began to consider how to remodel. For today's housing market, I must update outside and inside, plus new expectations of window compliance, sewer lateral compliance, and sidewalk repairs. My, my, my home is my first home purchase. I needed to move out at the end of 2018 so I could re begin to repair my home. I'm running out of time. E if I even had initial six months, I think my project could be completed in time. As it is with COVID-19 and home replacement needs due to California wildfires, home repair and replacements on a large scale are absorbing normally available workers. Finding local contract workers has been very difficult during COVID-19. Thank you for considering this constitutional change. There are so many urgent and important issues currently requiring California's attention. Yet it's still my hope that this potential time change is not lost within the many government concerns. This time change would make a huge difference to me and my future ability to live smoothly into retirement without fears of tax burdens that could prove to be outside my financial capabilities. 
Thank you for con your consideration, Catherine Kramer. Thank you. And that was um, uh, similar to the, the comment that was made by um, Ms. Ms. Blackwell. And we do have, um, so I apologize, there were actually eight speakers. Then we I have one additional, there's one additional that we were aware of as well. So there was a total of eight speakers today. And uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Thompson, we have two more speakers. Two more speakers? Okay. I, I only have the SC assessor employee, so um, I'll remark after after you read them in order. Thank you. Uh, Chair, thank you. Thank you. Chair Vasquez, uh, Vice Chair Schaefer, I just want to thank Mr. Nanjo for having identifiable speakers. We have not had any anonymous speakers today, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, go ahead, Mr. Gaines. I got a smile for Vasquez on that, Gary. Just in, in reference to uh, Catherine <laughs> Kramer's comments, Ms. Blackwell, I, I, I would like to have some follow up in terms of, you know, uh, what is the potential remedy? Oh, do you um, know the fetish they have about it? If it is, in fact, uh, yeah. legislation, I uh, would like to speak sure. to you more in terms of the interest in maybe just, following up on this. Vice Chair Schaefer, I think you need to uh, mute your mic. Thank you. Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Means. Yeah, it, well, we've got uh, two individuals that are, uh, you know, asking about COVID and the challenges that it's presented that's affect their, affected their base value. And, uh, you know, that's a critical timeline uh, that they have. And if it's been shortened as a result of a national uh uh, disaster uh, seems to me there ought to be some sort of of remedy and it, and if it's constitutional in nature it sounds like it needs to go back to the legislature um, so I, I would like to uh, follow up on this and see what the interest of the board is and uh, you know perhaps we could do some outreach to the legislature or through the governor's office I agree. So we'll take that up. Ms. Thompson? Yes, it would. Um, we, we did explore that, and it would require a constitutional amendment. Um, it would have to go to the voters. But um, Section uh, 2 of Article 13A of the California Constitution is, that, is the relevant constitutional uh, provision. So it would require an, amend, uh, an amendment to that before before any statutory changes could be made to code section 69.5. Okay, very well, thank you. It sounds like there is not a quick fix. There is not a quick fix. Yeah. They would have to go to to a vote and so. I, I don't, and I don't think it's the end of it. I bet you, I'd be willing to bet there's thousands of cases like this with people having trouble. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, if you're gonna, let's say you're getting your home prepared to sell, and you just can't get the contractors uh, in quickly enough, or uh, you're trying to buy another house and you need to do work to it. Uh, this seems to me that um, this is going to be a bigger and bigger issue. Yeah, Thank we had looked in we looked in several areas, um, you know, prior to finding the constitutional amendments to see if there was any possible way for an extension, regulations, codes, guidance, and unfortunately we couldn't. But it is a horrible situation for all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Chairman Vasquez, you got Stowers here? Yes, go ahead, Ms. Stowers. I understand it requires a constitutional amendment, but could our alleged um, staff prepare some language and then shop around for a legislator that might be willing to sponsor such a change to get it on a ballot sometime soon? Sure, I think that's a good idea. Uh, we could uh, make that recommendation to staff. Right. Yeah, Member Gaines, I uh, thank you, Member Stowers. I think that's a great idea. That gives us something tangible to follow up with. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> Mr. Nanjo, I think we had a couple more speakers, no? Yes, we do. We have, um, this is Henry Nanjo, Board Proceed Acting Board Proceedings Chief. The next uh, commenter is Robert Miller, and I'll read his comment, and then we have one more that I'm aware of after that. Um, Mr. Miller states, 
quote, I am a California homeowner seeking help with extending the two-year time frame to sell my Oakland home and be able to apply for tax benefits described in Proposition 60. Before COVID-19, retaining contractors was already more challenging due to them being booked for rebuilding after wildfires that have decimated parts of the Bay Area. With COVID-19 on top of that, it has been exceedingly difficult to engage contractors to prepare and remodel my home in order to bring it to market within the two-year time frame. 2020 has been a challenging year to proceed with work on my home project. I'm aware that a constitutional change will be required to extend this window between buying a home and selling a prior home. While the two-year period is adequate under normal conditions, clearly 2020 is not normal times. In order to be competitive under current market conditions, both exterior inter and interior renovations are necessary, along with other mandates from the City of Oakland and Alameda County. I much appreciate your consideration for this constitutional change. While there are issues currently requiring California's attention, I'm hopeful that this potential revision to the Constitution could be addressed and would help address housing affordability for me and other Californians in a similar situation. Thank you. And then we have one other uh, public comment, and I'll have Ms. Renati read that one. This public comment is from SCC Assessor Employee, Agenda Item C1, Taxpayer Bill of Rights Hearing. The comment states, appeals hearings should be done via video conferencing instead of in-person sessions during the pandemic. The reason is to minimize in-person contact to ensure the safety of everyone involved, saves lives and sufferings for all. That concludes the comment from SCC Assessor Employee. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Thompson, did you have any comments? Um, yes, I do. Thank you. Um, so um, this person was identified from the SEC assessor employee. I'm not sure exactly which county that is. There's several that have the uh, the letters SC in them. So um, their comment is about appeals, appeals hearings, and they felt for the safety of everyone, that they believe that appeals hearings should be done via video conferencing instead of in uh, live live in-person sessions during this pandemic. And um, we can certainly, certainly appreciate that. Um, there are 58 California counties and local appeal hearings procedures are conducted by that particular county um, proceedings. Um, but these are unique circumstances uh, that we are in with this COVID-19. Um, later in this meeting, actually one of the items on the agenda is the discussion of remote hearings uh, that is under item M, the public policy hearing. So, um, so that person um, should plan to listen to that. That'll be very insightful. Uh, and we do appreciate the comment and bringing it to our attention. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Nanjo, is that it for you? That is it for the submitted written comments. There may be other people on the line who wish to make public comments. We, um, with the chair's permission, we should uh, check with the AT&T operator to see if there's any other commenters for the uh, Taxpayer Rights Advocates uh, Bill of Rights hearing. Yes, let's do that. And ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to provide public comment, you may now press one then zero at this time. Once again, you may press one then zero at this time. And one moment, please. We did have one person queue up. And if you have not already pressed one and zero, you may do that at this time for public comment. And thank you for your patience. We'll open line number 18. Line number 18, your line is now open. Oh, hello. This is um, Kathleen Blackwell. And I just wanted to uh, thank you for addressing the issue of the um, time to your time extension on the base year transfer. Um, and I just wanted to kind of uh, offer to give any help if um, need be. 
Um, if I if I can do anything, contact uh, legislators or anything. Um, I'm available to do that. Th that's it. Thank you. <laughs> And at this time, we have no one else with public comments. Okay, Ms. Thompson, do you have anything else to, uh, or any closing comments? Um, just that we would like to thank everybody for joining us today for the Taxpayer Bill of Rights hearing and um, appreciate your comments and um, we'll be working with you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ms. Thompson. Uh, for hosting this annual taxpayer rights hearing. I think you did a great job uh, looking through the publication and it looks like obviously there's several things that uh, we can do hopefully to assist and help some of these taxpayers moving forward. Uh, I know some of them look like they're going to be more than just a short-term fix. It may take a little longer but uh, we appreciate the feedback that you gave us today and the suggestions. And also from uh, my colleagues and members, uh, thank you for your comments and suggestions. I think we have uh, some good ideas to hopefully pursue, uh, given the public comments we received today. And we will take those up. The uh, Mr. Chair, this is Melinda yes. Cohen. I've got a couple I'm of things. I'm sorry, Member Cohen, go ahead. I want to uh, just convey to uh, Lisa Thompson. I think um, I see much improvement in the Taxpayer Bill of Rights hearing, um, and I'm grateful for your work. I want to recognize the commenters uh, and, and testified and gave public comment. I thought it was very very um, uh, knowledgeable, and we welcome the, the feedback. I want to uplift and concur with um, Senator Gaines that we should be moving in the direction to have our alleged staff begin to explore and crafted legislation. That's our role as policymakers. One knowledge that there is a very large, I guess, what do they call it, leisure community, leisure time. I can't remember the name, the name, but there's a large community also, Rossmore, in my district uh, with thousands of folks. And if there is a loophole or if there is some kind of way that people are exploiting taxpayers, we can't sit idly by. So I'm really grateful for the caller that came in to share this information. And I hope that we will have urgency and we will not delay um, exploration of this legislation um, and uh, that we are thoughtful and uh, diligent about pursuing this. I think it's important. Um, and I also want to uh, work or that we um, impacts of COVID-19 uh, on the last fires last year, COVID-19 this year, and there's going to be some problems, I would imagine. Them. Ms. Cohen, you're freezing up on us. The, uh, parts of this and moving any kind of legislation forward is not going to be an easy feat, and it's actually one that um, um, we need to go with urgently. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chair Vasquez. Yes, Vice Chair Schaefer, go ahead. Yes, uh, I want to thank Ms. Thompson for a productive hearing. I'm so happy to learn about uh, Mr. Ballard's issues in, uh, in, in my district. I was unaware of them, and uh, that's one way uh, I learn and become a better member is from input uh, from people you bring before us. Uh, I'm the oldest uh, constitutional officer the state has ever seen, and I have to look out for the elderly people, out of whom who live in these stock communities. And if we do nothing else today except uh, ferret out this issue, uh, that will be a, a great credit to the Board of Equalization. And I thank you all. Yeah, if I could also, uh, this is Member Gaines. Member Gaines, uh, go ahead. Uh, Yeah, I just wanted to uh, thank Lisa Thompson, and uh, I think this is the best hearing that I've heard. And um, and I would agree with uh, Member Cohen in terms of the quality of the questions that are being brought up. Um, real real issues that I think uh, we can dig into and try to resolve and uh, work with the legislature um, in trying to 
um, solve some of these challenges and um, very concerned about this leisure world uh, arrangement, uh, which apparently is not ownership. Still not clear on Mr. Ballard's case uh, with his mother. Apparently, he mentioned that there was a um, joint tenants status, a deed uh, that apparently disappeared at some point through the process. So I, we really need a lot more information uh, on this, but um, gosh, I want to make sure that that folks understand uh, what sort of arrangements they're getting into. Uh, if they're being told they're getting ownership and it's not a deed, it's stock, uh, that just seems like a, a very um, different and I would say a difficult uh, concept that, I mean, I'm not familiar with it and I'm sure uh, they weren't going through this process. And uh, um, home ownership is really our, um, our one asset that, uh, you know, Californians have that if they've got social security and hopefully they put some money into an IRA, but that big nest egg is through home, home ownership. And so we uh, want to make sure that people are treated fairly through the process and have that ability um, to take advantage of appreciation. They, I guess the statistics say that appreciation averages about 3% a year for real estate nationally. And, um, you know, it's, it's been a, a blessing and a curse in California because the appreci appreciation rate in some parts of California but much more dramatic, which has created wealth for folks, um, but provide, provided other challenges. But I, I don't think we can do enough to um, dig into these issues and uh, work as a, as a board to try to provide relief. So thank you and uh, keep up the work and uh, we'll move forward. Take care. Thank you. And thank you, members. Uh, I think we're on to something here that hopefully will benefit the taxpayers moving forward. Uh, like I mentioned, some of these look like we could handle in a short term. Some of these others look like they might be long term in terms of uh, having some success and hopefully some relief. You know, I wasn't aware that Leisure World was handled that way myself either. To me, it sounds like it's almost like a timeshare of some sort that you really don't have a tangible deed. But I guess as we move forward, we'll look into that and hopefully get some answers and resolve some of these issues for these folks. Uh, with that, I wanted to just uh, put out there that, let's see if we can get through uh, item G and J, and then we'll take a break. How, how do members feel about that? Are we okay in terms of the um, individual recording the meeting? That's what I was asking. Uh, I, Does that person need a break? Or? Thank you for asking members. I think we're okay to proceed as Chairman Vasquez has suggested. This is Henry Nancho. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let, let me uh, have Ms. Davis if you can call item G. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the next item on the agenda is G1, Proposed Readoption of Emergency Property Tax Rule 202, presented by Mr. Lawrence Lynn of the Legal Department. Mr. Lynn, are you on the line and available to make your report? Uh, yes, I am. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, good morning, Chairman Vasquez and members of the board. My name is Lawrence Lynn, and I am a tax counsel with the Legal Department. I'm here to request that the board vote to readopt emergency rule 202, which is titled allocation of aircraft of certificated air carriers and scheduled air taxi operators. Now, if you'll recall, this rule previously came before the board last month, whereby the board voted to initiate the certificate of compliance process so as to make the emergency rule permanent. This month, I am here to request that the board readopt rule 202 as an emergency regulation. The purpose of this readoption is to extend the term of the emergency regulation so that there is ample time to make the rule permanent. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, members, uh, if there's no questions or comments, I would like to entertain, well, Ms. Davis, we don't have any uh, public comment on this, do we? We can check with AT&T. AT&T moderator, can you please let us know if there's anyone on the line who'd like to make a public comment regarding this matter? 
Yes, ma'am. One moment, please. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have a public comment pertaining to this matter, please press 1 then 0 at this time. And I show no one in queue. Please continue. Uh, Vice Chair Schaefer here. I would uh, move uh, uh, adoption of the requested relief. It's been moved by our Vice Chair Schaefer. Second. And second by Mr. Jenks. Seeing no hands or comments, uh, can we get Ms. Davis to call the roll? Chairman Vasquez? Yes. Vice Chair Schaefer? Yes. Member Gaines? Yes. yes. Member Cohen? Yes. Deputy Controller Stower? Yes. So that's unanimous. Um, with that, uh, Ms. Davis, I guess the next item we need to call is Jay. Yes, our next item is the Administrative Consent Agenda, which is J1, approval of the board meeting minutes for June 9th, 2020. So, uh, Vice Chair Schaefer, so move. It's been moved by our Vice Chair Schaefer. I will second it. Is there any comments or questions about the agenda? Approval, this is approval of the agenda, or actually the board minutes of June 9th, 2020. Seeing no hands, we will go ahead and uh, Ms. Davis, if you can call the roll. Chairman Vasquez? Yes. Vice Chair Schaefer? Yes. Member Gaines? Yes. Member Cohen? Yes. Deputy Controller Stowers? Yes. So that's unanimous. Uh, it looks like we might have time to go ahead and take one more item that we can take up L as well. We, we have the remainder of J. Um, the administrative consent agenda is J2, approval of the invitation to county assessment. Oh, yes, meeting. yes. You're right. I forgot about that. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Sure. Uh, the item is J2, approval of the invitation to county assessors to meet with the board on October 20, 2020. Yes, members, you know, on this item, we do need to take a vote. And it's uh, basically calling, uh, well, we officially announcing the invitation to have our annual meeting with the, the Board of County Assessors. And I believe we have a date we're looking in October. Is that correct, Steph? That is correct. And this is no, a, vir a virtual, it's a virtual, we're not gonna physically go anywhere. That's what it looks like right now. Even though it's in October, I don't see us having it in person. I think it'll be a virtual or a Zoom of some sort. So moved. That is correct. Second. It's Gaines. been moved by Gaines and second by our vice chair. Seeing no comments or questions. Can we take a roll call on that? Chairman Vasquez? Yes. Vice Chair Schaefer? Yes. Member Gaines? Yes. Member Cohen? Aye. Deputy Controller Stowers? Yes. So that's unanimous. And now with that. Uh, Looks like we may be able to take one more item before we take a quick break, sir. If that's that's okay. what I was going to ask. Uh, go ahead. Uh, go ahead and call that, Ms. Davis. Our next item is I-1, Chief Counsel Matters, presented by Chief of Legal, Mr. Nanjo, and Tax Counsel 4, Richard Moon. Gentlemen, are you both available to proceed? Yes, we are. Go ahead. Yes, we are. Thank you. Um, so, members, this is a, what we, uh, uh, what we received was uh, the BOE Legal Department received a request from, or um, a request from the Court of Appeals down in Los Angeles County. Uh, to weigh in on a case involving um, assessor, Los Angeles County Assessor Jeffrey Prang uh, in a matter he has in litigation against the Amon Family Trust. Um, 
I have uh, tax counsel for Mr. Uh, Richard Moon, who's available to answer any questions. I have provided the board members individually some background on this matter. Um, it is the uh, legal department's intention to file a somewhat neutral amicus brief, essentially uh, describing for the court the, the rules that the Board of Equalization currently have uh, in place on this matter, and um, that would be the extent of our participation. Mr. Moon, do you have anything to add? Uh, I, I would only add that uh, although we're not taking uh, a strong position either way, uh, our indirect uh, guidance um, that, that's already out there, um, in particular our regulations, um, would uh, support the, the side that's taken uh, being taken in, in the case by the, um, uh, by, the, by the appellant. So this is an opportunity for the board to answer, uh, ask any questions. Otherwise, um, it is the intention of the legal department to file the amicus brief as the court has directed by uh, early September. I believe the deadline is September 10th that they've given us that it needs to be filed by. Uh, actually, I, I think the, um, the, the deadline is, um, is, uh, is this Friday. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you for correcting me, Mr. Moon. Uh, do any any questions from the board members? Otherwise, this is an informational item for the board. Members, any questions? No. No. Mr. Gaines, are we good? Hearing and I'm hearing no no other questions or comments. I think we're good. Thank you very much. Chairman Vasquez, uh, Vice Chair Schaefer, and members of the board. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have time to take up K, or should we wait until after the break? Um, I believe we, we would need to take a break at this time, sir. Let's do it. So we're looking at 1220. So what are we looking at? What about, what do we need, 20, 25 minutes? Let me check with our executive director to find out um, her direction. Sure. Uh, thank you, um, oh, yeah. um, Chairman Vasquez. We'd like to take a 25-minute break, if we could, please. Let's do a 25-minute break. Thank so you, it is 12:20. So we'll reconvene. Um, what do we look? It looks like I guess about 12:45. Is that good? Yes. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you.